good morning. Okay, so I see the early birds are here. So for five minutes early. So what we get to do is, you know, now you are regular. This is the part where I get to pretend to be fella before he will start his show. When Baba will just generally do what we call your busy, you know, we just talk. So quite aside from what I said, I'm going to be talking about this week, which is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess. We'll still talk about that, but we'll start talking about that on the dot of it. But there is something I said earlier in the week that a lot of people asked questions and I did promise that I'll talk about it before service today. This is our own Sunday service now, since we won't go to church. Or some of you will still go, some of you have already gone. So what do I want to talk about? I said every victim of Nigeria is a Biafran. And a lot of people are asking, what does that mean and all of that? So I'll explain. You see, the thing with Nigeria is that, I've said repeatedly, we are a people without citizenship. So in the absence of citizenship, we all become tribesmen. So rights are located in Nigeria based on the capacity of your ethnic group to project power. So we talk about the Fulanese being at the apex. That is the way the typical Nigerian view it. We conveniently forget that in actual fact, the frontline victims of the Nigerian state is a Fulani peasantry because they are the actual beginning and foundation for the feudal, the feudal state that is evolving. So when a person is consistently victimized and disadvantaged by the Nigerian state, it is legitimate to actually say that the person is a Biafran because the Biafran is actually the archetype of the Nigerian victim. I would explain, don't worry. Now, calm down, calm down. We are talking to ourselves. Look at it this way. A civil war ended, and everybody was told, no victor, no vanquished. But that was a lie. And you all know it. It was a blatant lie. Now, I'm not looking to paint Ndigbo like the victim they sometimes like to paint themselves. Because to a very large extent, Ndigbo has been complicit in the evils that have been perpetrated against Ndigbo. A lot of Ndigbo politicians built their powers and wealth on the back of grievance politics. But they never really sought to advance the lot of the people themselves. They just used the noise to legitimize their own demands for seats at the table of impunity that governs Nigeria. So for a long time, everything that could be deployed, okay, so you talk about educationally disadvantaged states, I assure you that the persons who bought the brunt of those kind of policies, educationally disadvantaged state, uh, quota systems, all the systems that were kept, in, that were put in place in the governance of Nigeria as it moved away from the regions and increasingly became a feudal state that pretends to even be a unitary system. All those systems of evil, of marginalization, they were first proven against the Igbo. And when that was happening, the whole of us, the whole of lot of us, the Yorubas, the people who call themselves the middle belt today, all of us, we were happy because there was enough to go around. As a lot, we were happy to go along with these marginalizations, institutionalizations of these dual multiple citizenship systems. So when I speak of the Igbo, the Igbo people, as being the archetype of the disadvantaged Nigeria, is not me talking about them as a group. I am talking about everybody who, against whom Nigeria has perpetrated one injustice or the other, whether that be a Nuri man, a Fulani man, a Nupe man, a Yoruba man, and a German. You are being treated like that because none of us are citizens. We are tribesmen. And in the order of tribal persecution, 
those are the ones at the lowest rung of the ladder until recently when the victimization now went around the world and it has now emerged more as a class thing than as a tribal or ethnic construct. But like I said, that was the aside. It's now eight o'clock. Welcome to each and every one of you who is joining us now. I usually have that part where probably I use it to settle myself into this subject. And I think I might want to go back to this intro about the Nigerian and the Biafran question in another sermon on another day because it's provoked quite a bit of thought and I realized that I have not had enough time to deal with the substance of the issues that I have raised. But if you are interested, and um, for, those, for those of you who were not with us from the beginning, that was at five, um, 7.55, you might want to take a look on my YouTube channel later on to familiarize yourself with that. But this morning, I am more interested in speaking to a subject that has become particularly relevant in recent days, but one that I have dealt with at some depth and to some extent in my book, The Imperatives of the Nigerian Revolution. I believe you will find that at page 263. I actually delayed the publication of the book because I realized the centrality of religion to the place where we are today as a people. So at the time the book was to come out, I delayed it so that I might write that section. So it might be of interest to you. You can download the book free from my website, elifarotimi.com. Uh, the book is there for free. Uh, if, you are in, if you are looking to enrich me, you can go to Amazon and go and buy it. And there are a few bookshops in Nigeria that sells it, but more importantly, you need to read. Because there is very little that I'm going to say to you today that I did not put in that book. But there is this wicked thing that racists are want to say. They will say that if you really want to hide knowledge from a black man, you should put it in a book. I don't want to hide knowledge from you, so I'm compelled to speak to you or speak with you as I'm attempting to simply because I know that even though this book has been available for free for two years now, very few of you have bothered to avail yourself of the opportunity to feed your brain. So let's talk, since you won't read. So what is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess? Is Nigeria in a mess? I think that would be a good place to start from. But I also think that that would largely be a rhetorical question because the one thing almost all of us appear to be agreed on is the fact that our country is in a mess. We're in a place that would be frightening to anyone who is still managing to retain the use of their brain. We should be worried and we should really, really be worried if we're people capable of contemplation, introspection, and vision. Because we are indeed in a very deep mess. But with every mess comes multiple opportunities. And opportunities can only be found on knowledge. And this is one of the reasons why I have decided to take it upon myself. I will as much as time allows, deal with different subjects from Sundays to Sundays. Don't worry, I'm not competing with any churches and I'm not asking for any offerings. So we can actually at least establish as a fact that Nigeria is indeed in a mess on multiple fronts. But in our mess, there are opportunities, as I have said. What is the role of religion in the Nigerian mess? The role, of the role of religion in the Nigerian mess is foundational. It is deep. It is central to the very existence 
of the contraption known as Nigeria. Without religion, there probably wouldn't even be a Nigeria. Because Nigeria is essentially the product of British greed. And British greed was essentially anchored on the back of its economic interests, packaged in religious and pious terms. But for us to have a clear understanding of where I'm going with this, I would have to offer you a bit of contextual basis. I was born a Christian. My paternal grandmother was a prophetess in the Kerugum and Seraphim Church. I was raised a Christian. I remain a Christian, but I am not a religionist. I was having a chat with my wife like a week ago, and I remember saying to her, and I think to another friend, that I thank God for the abundance of my carnality. Because in the absence of that, I might have ended up behind the pulpit and you'll be robbed of the opportunity to listen to the madman that you are listening to today. So religion is um, something that we're all born with. The spirituality that religion should guide us to it is something that we would all have to evolve. Religion comes from the Latin word, religare. And there is old French. Is it old French is religio? One is religio, the other is religare. But the one that is religare, I believe that's old Latin. It speaks to binding. It, it, it actually speaks to fettering the imagination of man. Because, you know, the Bible says, quoted on quotes now, the art of man is desperately evil. Some say it's wicked. So what religion tries to do is to provide structures, systems, within which man could live a disciplined life that makes him, renders him amenable to control within a society. If you manage to find God in the mix, it means that you begin to evolve a religion and you begin to evolve a relationship with God. So we must quickly distinguish religion and spirituality. Crazy as it might sound to some of you, I am deeply, deeply, I don't know, I won't say spiritual, but I have a relationship with my God. And I do not deprecate anyone's attempts at building relationships with God through religion. But you must understand very quickly that religion must be distinguished from spirituality. So how does this relate to Nigeria? I'm merely offering you context so that you would understand that I'm not anti any religion, be that Christianity or Islam. But there is a generalized nature to the guilt related to religiosity and practically everything that is wrong with us as a people. Because whilst we profess God in our private spaces, whilst you find churches and mosques proliferating all over the place, there is very little of God in our space as evidenced by the eminent putrefaction of our society. So, how has religion been foundational to our mess? It goes into our history, and I'll go a bit back. Long before Christianity found its way to our shores, Islam was here. Islam was the foundation for the construction of two empires, 
these empires traduce what is today generally referred to as northern Nigeria and extends well beyond the borders of what we call Nigeria today. There was first the Kanembono Empire. This you'll find in today's Borono part of Yube. That is the Kanori based empire, and it was an Islamic one. The second was the Danfodio Caliphate, the Sokoto Caliphate. It emerged from its own ruination of the Abe dynasty, the Ausa kings. These two Islamic empires coexisted not necessarily on friendly terms, but they coexisted on the basis of the clear understanding fostered after the Kanemish letter to the Caliph, making clear that as a fellow Islamic empire, they were due the courtesies extended in Islamic theology and jurisprudence to every other Islamic kingdom. So the two managed to find some detente and coexisted side by side. But those who you today know as Christians in northern Nigeria were largely people who had to fight to make sure that they were not enslaved, or those whom both sides either deliberately left unconquered to be used as slave stocks in the trans-Saharan slave trade, which preceded any transatlantic slave trade. So let's be clear. Before the British came, parts of what you call Northern Nigeria today, such as the Plateau, Southern Borono, parts of Kebi, vast parts of the Medu Belt, most part of what we had blithely referred to as Northern Nigeria, were people who either were able to withstand Fulani conquest or Kanuri conquest and managed to stave off destruction before the British came with colonization. So for those people who either embraced Christianity, in fact, they largely embraced Christianity in protest against those who had either enslaved them or assailed them before the coming of the British. So for the people in that part of Nigeria, religion is a matter of identity. It is not a matter of faith. Let me be clear. Religion is a matter of identity. It's a function of deviance of a people saying, we survived your generational assault on us. It was an act of deviance. They embraced Christianity. They didn't do so with the British happy with what was happening. But you will find several reports of frictions between the missionaries and the colonialists. Multiple reports. And you'll find multiple examples of protests by the northern Muslim emperors, emirs and sultan, Shehu, complaining about the actions of the missionaries amongst those they had come to regard as their stock. So let's be clear. Brutal fact, religion in northern Nigeria be that Islam or Christianity was always a function of identity. When the British came, 
and these lines were being drawn, there was a wise man in northern Nigeria, Sir Amadu Bello, very wise man. He crafted a policy of one north. He understood clearly the identity politics that religion was capable of foisting on northern Nigeria. So he proclaimed that northern Nigeria was one. And he tried as much as possible to avoid pandering to Islamist sentiments. I wrote at length in the book about how he resisted the origins of Gumi's father's demand. He, re he resisted that, the, that demand that Sharia should be imposed in northern Nigeria. He resisted it. And he instead brought the Pina Code in northern Nigeria as a compromised position. So religion has always been central to the politics. I'll let you learn the basis of the Middle Belt Revolt on your own. But suffice to say that religion is central. When you come to the southern part of Nigeria, where the British found people who were largely, there was Islam, in, before I forget, there was already Islam in southern Nigeria, brought by Marian traders, and they were already established in places like Lagos, long before any Fulani or Kanuri crossed over into Yoruba land. Islam had entered Yoruba land through the Malian traders. So it wasn't, it's not a function of um, any jihad introducing Islam to Yoruba land. That is why you have the one in the war claiming that he's the sultan of so i'll leave you to learn that history on your own but it's important to understand that islam was already here but islam found a people who are largely cosmopolitan in their views of life generally the yorubas have never been constrained until very recently by overt religiosity there is a level of liberalism that you will find in religions in, like, in Yoruba land, when in the same home, you will find the, the syncretism is almost amazing. Somebody is both a Muslim and uh, a consulter, a con uh, yeah, he consults with Babalawos and will gladly visit a white government Babalawo as well. So generally in Southern Nigeria, particularly amongst the Yorubas, we've always had a pretty much open mind about religion. So you find very quickly that in Yoruba land, until the coming of partisan politics in the 50s, religion wasn't really a thing. But even then, it was restricted to a very narrow part, the silver of Yoruba land, that was largely around the Edeiwo axis because of the deep penetration of Islam in that part and the recourse to um, Islam as a mobilization tool. It wasn't even a, it wasn't an Islamization. There was nothing about it that sought to convert anybody, but it was a matter of identity for certain people and a way to rally the people generally found in that Eder, Ikirun, um, Iwo. That, that's where you still find the bulk of Islamist scholars within the western part of Nigeria. And then the Akoko uh, acts. But anyway, for, for, what, for all his work, Islam was a tool of mobilization for some people. And then Chiva Ulawo and AG found ways to appease these emergent tendencies. And they found very quickly that because of the nationalist outlook, and I'm talking about the Yoruba nationalist outlook of the action group, um, you find very quickly that a lot of religionist resistance fizzled out. 
because nobody was looking to marginalize anybody. So there was sufficient room for everybody. So to a very large extent, anyone seeking to use religion as a tool of political mobilization in Yoruba land largely fell flat. Not that they didn't try, it was always there. There was always the Irish, there were the Irish callers of the world. Everybody still recognized the potentials of the mosque as political rallying ground. But I believe it was the overt pressure of the Christians in Yoruba land that eventually began to allow room for Islamist politicians in Yoruba land. And I'll explain. When Oba Sojo came with his Pentecostal vavo in 1999, with his overtly Pentecostal tones, the animal called man, his protestations of religiosity, the multiple high-profile visits to churches, the identification with a lot of churches began to appropriate to themselves some measure of influence that lent credence to the cries of marginalization that you could hear from the Muslims, particularly the likes of Ishaq Akintola who, whilst I was in Lasso, was essentially a fringe figure, but I'd always howled about marginalization and I'd always sought to divide based on religion, but nobody paid him much mind in those days. But as the Pentecostals and the politicians cuddle up more and more, the optics began to lend credence to the rants of the madman. And increasingly, you found bodies like Nasfat springing up, enabled to a very large extent, particularly in Lagos State, by the likes of Bola Tinubu, Aregbejola, not querying anybody's right to their religiosity, but it was equally an engagement point for Islamist politics. But that is without any prejudice to the right of a Muslim to respond to the overt attempts at Christianizing the space and the corridors of power. I profile pastors forever visiting one governor or the other, conducting Thanksgiving services, New Year services, having governors and senators come to church, no matter how odious they might be. It was very easy to have these reactions. And it became deeper as the years have rolled by. Hmm. Today, reality is that religion is central. To the putrefaction of Nigeria. What has brought this about is the proliferation of evil in the face of our protestation of God. Everywhere you turn, shouting, Oh, Lord God, this God, you do the God, Jesus, this, I am to like this one, that one. We pray before we start the meetings, but we are plotting evil in the meeting. We give tithes and offerings from stolen money. Pastors, imams, we embrace evil. So I'm looking at our current transition program. And then I saw a piece during the week 
at the PFM in Lagos State has endorsed Governor Babajide Sonwolu for a second time. And I asked myself, what is the basis? Exactly what is the basis? I know as a fact that God is the God of truth. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Where was the PFM after the murders, the massacre? at the toll gate. What did the PFN say at that time? The League of Imams, what did they say? I know individuals spoke, but where were they all? God is the God of truth. Where were they? What stilled their tongues? What did they have to say at that time? When the palliatives were hoarded, and I'm not talking Lagos State alone, I'm talking all over Nigeria. When the palliatives were hoarded, when politicians were sharing palliatives as souvenirs at parties, where? For the pastors and the mouse. Hmm? When the mosques and churches were opened, and the children of the poor, who are the only ones still attending Nigerian universities, at least the public ones, were at home for eight months, where were the imams and the pastors? Where were they? When people were being kidnapped up and down the length and breadth of Nigeria, aside from Gumi who assigned himself the duty of speaking for terrorists, where were the pastors and the imams? What did they say? How many press conferences did they call? How many of our politicians and ruiners did they call out? Where were they? Like seriously? Like, where were you all? The pastors? The imams? Where were you? when all these were happening. Like, the reality that shouldn't escape any thinking being still stuck in this place called Nigeria is the fact that the religious class and the political class have become one. The pastors and the imams have the job of conditioning your minds to accept the mess that you see out there. They will preach to you about how you should accept your lot and there is heaven waiting at the end of your turmoil and travels on heart. If religion was so fantastic, you really believe that Oibo man will give it to you? Please, understand it for what it is. Religion means to bind. It binds the mind. It binds the mind, the imagination, 
The seat of a man's creativity is his mind. Some wise man said, if the mind is blind, the eyes are useless. There is a Bible in almost every language. In fact, I'm sure there is a Bible in every language in the world. I'm not sure the Islamists have been as generous, but I know that quite a few languages have had the Quran translated. Well, how many have bothered to translate science texts, philosophical texts? Why are we learning in foreign languages? Why am I teaching or seeking to teach in foreign language? Why is it that this, the, the, the cultural genocide, because that is what religion in Africa really represents, the Abrahamic faith, the Abrahamic religion in Africa is essentially a tool of mind control. Free your minds of overt religiosity. By all means, use your religion as a vehicle to spirituality. But understand very clearly, religion in Nigeria is a business and it is largely complicit in the mess that Nigeria has become. This is without prejudice to good men and women who seek to broaden the path to God, be they Muslims or Christians. I'm not drawing, look, there are good men and women out there, and I know a few who seek to lead men and women to God, both Muslims and Christians. But there is a difference between those who seek to liberate your mind by allowing you to realize the spiritual dimensions that they are to you. And then there are those who are in the majority who seek to use religion to extract your values. And those are not merely your pastors and imams. Your rulers work in concert with them. Religion is central to how we are, why we got to where we are today. If I offer you a window into understanding the problem, but I omit to offer you solutions, at least as I believe possible, then I would have left you only halfway to the destination. Hold on to your religion. But understand that it is between you, only you, and God. There is only so much that we know, and we only ever know a part. Do not presume to know what is best for the next man. And do not interpret everything through the prisms of your own religiosity. I just one teeny weeny bit the scheme of God's universe. He doesn't need you to hate anyone on his behalf. Because in hating another person, you legitimize the same against yourself. And religion is only one of the many ways in which we've been divided. And it is in our division that legitimacy has been found for the mess we are in. Nobody asks your religious identity when you go to the market. You don't have the religious identity of your doctor or the pilot on your planes. Recognize it for what it is. Religion. Religare. If you found one of those dictionaries that would typically have illustrations, you find that there is a finch. Finch is a liquid bed, really small, one of the smallest of beds. And then he has his wings tight. Your mind is the seat of your imagination. If your mind is captured, your capacity to think beyond the stricture of 
whatever has captured your mind, be that religion, ethnicity, hate, even love. It captures your mind. But the bad one is when religion captures your mind. Religions are human constructs. You hear me? They are human constructs. Our forefathers were not religious. They were spiritual. They referred God so much, they will fall on their knees in reference of God when they see the works of his hand. Idiots claim that we were worshipping those trees and mountains and rivers. We were not worshipping them. We were worshipping God. And a lot of people still do today. Why is it that it is only against the African that the grace that you will find in Acts of Apostle, I believe is chapter 23, verse 17. Why is it that that grace is not available to the African? As I walked through your city, I came upon the monument. It says to, her, to the unknown God. It says, that God whom ye do not know is the one I have come to reveal to you. Why was it possible for Paul to recognize the spirituality of those he met in that city and then proceed to reveal Christ to them through their own religion. But it was impossible for European missionaries to enter Africa, recognize our spirituality and then reveal Christ to us through our own spirituality. Why was it necessary to demonize the totality of our spirituality. Why was it necessary for Lalu Giriyoko to become the biblical Satan or the Islamic Shaitan? How? How did they quail to become Satan? That, those are stories that you must look to, exp to find on your own so that you might be able to free your minds. Find God. Find God. Yes, there is a path, and there are multiple paths to God, true religion. But if you don't study to prove thyself, how do you learn? Find God on your own. Do not allow religion to enslave you. It is what has enslaved Nigerians. What is it about some old Lou that recommends them to the PFM? Is this something to do with what is sugar daddy has been given to the PFN or has given to the PFN? What is the basis beyond politics? Men who will not be found opening their gobs when people are being killed, when Eve is multiplying in the land. They remember their voices when their livelihoods are threatened. Oh. Let's end the lecture here, Diary. I've been a Simon to call him. But more importantly, and now that lecture is closed now, more importantly, Saturday. You know, you and I know, especially we are in Lagos, we whooped, we whooped the Baptist Nyash. We beat them black and blue. On the 25th, we did. All they're doing is they're trying to steal a vote. We'll deal with that when we get there. But there is another one, another opportunity to send another clear message. And that is on Saturday. Just in a few days' time. We get to pay them back. We pay back for the hours spent at the toll gate queuing. We pay them back for everybody that was attacked trying to protest the imposition of those toll gates, be that the one on Lekki Expressway or the one on Lekki Koi Bridge. We pay them back. It's time. You know when they hired Turks to attack us when we were trying to protest them? This was long before 2020. Yeah, we don't forget. We remember. And you, 
mustn't forget. Remember that. Remember it. They will send their thoughts quite all right. It's their way. We are aware of that. To get dog, carry your dog, like I go poles. And you know what I mean by dog. Yeah, to get dog, pull your dog, like I go poles. Make we see now. If somebody else bleed different from me and you, let's be clear about that. The only way you assert your freedom is by going out to vote in the face of their overt intimidation. Go out and vote. And yes, good, good, very borrows viable. Oh, yes, they call him Chinedu. He's one of his given names. His mother is Igbo, but his father is a shun of the shun. We know where his father's, father's, father's placentas are buried. When we come closer to the election, I would have my say. But Jide Sonwolu, we remember Lekki Togate. We remember the massacre. And in spite of your lies, we know as a fact that you visited hospitals in the middle of the night. They were busy switching off light in the hospital so that you could enter with some measure of anonymity. Keep lying to yourself. You're fooling nobody. We remember, even if we don't have bodies to bury, even if we don't have anything by which to prove because you've kept obfuscating the waters, you pay the 100 million in two tranches of 50, 50 million in cash to those who were killed, to those who lost limbs, and you keep lying. Even the Nigerian army said so, and you keep lying, we will pay you back. And that's only one of your many sins and those of your sugar daddy. We'll pay you back. See you. <laughs> we'll see you on Saturday. Pack your load. Bye. Oh, yes. All those pastors and imams busy endorsing if God is watching you and you render your account. Oh, I'm blessed.